Hello, everybody. This is the Progress Report for this uh, uh, December Wednesday, December 22, three days till Christmas. Christmas and Eve, Eve, Eve. Christmas Eve, Eve, Eve. Yep. Yes, yes. I'm already in the spirit. Yeah, you really are, Mike. I got to congratulate my buddy here. The green hat, the red Oh, no, thing. Farley's got a funny hat on. What are they going to talk about today? Well, <laughs> I'll and, take it off. We'll get serious in a minute. But we, we're, we are definitely going to get serious in a minute. Uh, we are expecting, and I believe we have, yep, There's Arnie. the incredible, indomitable, always, always, uh, I don't know. What can I say? You're you're an amazing person, Arnie, and we're so proud to have you Vivacious, on the show. energetic. When we have when engaging. we have the opportunity, we just love it. I only wish you could be here with us, but we got we got to get some audio called, on her. No, this is I the think best called, we're going to get. Remember? Do you have my audio? Yeah, that's the best we get. We have a very low volume, so we're what we're going to have to do is be, be quiet and pay attention when you're talking. The okay. audience can hear you fine. Uh, okay, that's Arnie, good. we're going to lead off with a uh, very short video that Mike picked up from the Lincoln Project, which I think will okay. fit into what we want to discuss with you very, very well. And folks, uh, please join us by uh, you know calling in at this 603-640-3091, because we're going to talk about, I think today, among other things, what I consider to be not a frivolous, but a very serious threat to our democracy in this country right now with a Trump takeover of the Republican Party. But let's go well, to the video. To set the tone, let's uh, roll the tape. got notification here from the Capitol Police that there is a threat inside. You know, I could watch the House floor and I could see some of the floor staff running. I, you just don't see that inside the House chamber. Uh, the protesters have penetrated uh, the Capitol. Tear gas has been deployed. Uh, members are now have masks that are in the Capitol. people's concerns, but there is no place for violence. I've served in places overseas in Africa and Afghanistan and other where where violence is how we solve our disputes, not here in America. We solve it through debate and discussion. Doing, but we are moving downstairs into the basement. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Mike, for that. That is the perfect lead-up to what I wanted to talk about. We are less than two weeks away from the first anniversary of the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol on January 5th last year. Six. Six, I'm sorry, six. An attempt to override the legitimate, fair election we had that determined that the, the vast majority of voters and the majority of Electoral College uh, voters selected Joe Biden to be president and not Donald J. Trump. And yet here we are facing dire consequences uh, for so many people that stood up to ensure that that proper election result could, be, could obtain. Dire consequences, uh, attacks, vicious attacks. And um, I, I am personally very, very concerned that the very future of democracy in the United States of America is in dire peril. It's hard to imagine that. That's the problem. We don't have the imagination. But I want to recommend everybody, everybody, the newest, newest issue of the Atlantic Magazine, one of my favorite publications, this entire issue is about the consequences of the failure of that um, insurrection attempt on January 6th, but it was only considered, as the, as the cover says right here, January's practice by Barton Gelman. You should read about this. You'd read about the one Republican congressman who deigned to dared to vote because he knew it was the right thing to hold Trump accountable for that insurrection and the attacks upon him. I mean, it's, it's just sickening. It's just sickening that an entire party in our country, we only have two parties that count for anything. You know, the libertarians, they're kind of a, you know, frivolity, really. 
oh, of the two major parties in our country, one has been taken over by a proto-fascist who wants to end democracy in the country, or is willing to end it in order to regain power. And uh, it's appalling. We cannot ignore this. And I, 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 I've said enough. <laughs> can, can I jump in? You, you talked about consequences. You, you talked about being held accountable. Um, I did a little bit of research. I'd like to take just a couple quick minutes Please um, to talk about um, an, another situation where there were consequences. What we're seeing is we're seeing um, hundreds of people who were in the Capitol building and be uh, misbehaved in the Capitol building and, and were kind of the foot soldiers of this movement to take over our government and deny um, the transition of power. They're all going to trial. They're pleading out. They're getting sentenced. But the upper echelons of people are not. And that's what we're going to talk about in the, in the show today. But um, uh, just this week, uh, requests were made to sitting members of Congress um, for information. Uh, you, you know, uh, Jim Jordan, they were trying to put him on this commission when he actually, he's, he's a witness and, and a potential suspect in, in, in the case. Um, but the, w what I want to get to is this, oh, it's unprecedented. It's up in arms. You, you can't um, do anything to a sitting senator or a sitting congressman. But the fact of the matter is that... In our history, um, we have had a time uh, when sitting senators, 10 senators, were expelled at, uh, in 1861 uh, for not recognizing Abraham Lincoln as the president, and, but rather um, participating in the insurrection. And the reason I'm bringing it up today is because it was a New Hampshire senator who uh, actually brought the resolution to expel them. And Brendan, that's the picture I sent over, if you want to put it up. It was Senator yeah. Daniel Clark of New Hampshire, and there he is, such a handsome New Hampshire man. Take he a look certainly at is. Um, he uh, brought the resolution to expel the senators um, who had uh, denied Lincoln as president and had gone into insurrection, and that resolution passed 32 to 10, and those senators were indeed expelled from the Senate. And in fact, three representatives in the House of Representatives were also expelled. Uh, for similar reasons. So uh, this is what you do when you have sitting members of Congress and sitting senators who support insurrection and don't recognize the election of a new president. Yeah. You ask them, um, did Joe Biden win the election? And when they say something like, well, he is the president, then you look into them and, and you expel Absolutely. them because Absolutely. they're part of the insurrection. I'm done talking. To, sorry to take so much time because we got well, a great I just guest I just want to add one quick thing because I want Arnie to have plenty of time here. You know, 1860 Abraham Lincoln was elected president. Most of the South recognized that he was elected president, and they chose to secede. Today. You know, most of the Republicans don't recognize that Joe Biden was elected president. So this is this is a shockingly unprecedented thing, and they're gearing up to, to come after us in 2024. Well, I when don't, Trump, I, if he if he, unless a biology intervenes, is going to be the nominee of the Republican I, Party. I think again. there is much uh, there, there, there is much precedent for this. I've, this is a pattern that I've seen in my study of history, and uh, I think Arnie will want to talk about that. Why don't we bring her in? We Let's bring in Arnie. We got Arnie with us. We can't have better. <laughs> You just, I, I'm so grateful for what you just taught me about that New Hampshire senator. I am so grateful for what you just taught me. Now, here's the question. Could we teach what you just taught us on the air in a New Hampshire history class? Or would that be challenged as Good divisive? question. No, 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 no. I am dead. I am too. Serious. That's it, with the I new law. Never, let, me, let me beg you to write an op-ed to contact Gene Shaheen, contact Maggie Hassan. Let them all know what you just shared with us. Let them all know, because they are being attacked, they are being undermined, and it's not going to be what's going on in Washington that we should be afraid about. What we should be afraid about is what's going to be going on in state capitals around the country. That's where we're going to lose our democracy. It's not going to happen in Congress. I mean, yes, we want them to get rid of the filibuster. Yes, we want them to pass. I mean, let's assume. But the problem right now is it's what's happening in state after state. And let me tell you what I have in front of me. I have an article from the New York Times. Here's the title of the article. Voting battles of 2022 take shape as GOP crafts new election bills. Right? These are election bills that they basically are either going to suppress the franchise, they're going to decide that they want to come up with whatever the voting conclusion is, no matter how people exercise the franchise. So it's said, listen to this, Republicans plan to carry their push to reshape the nation's electoral system into next year, with Democrats vowing to oppose them. 
but holding few options in GOP-led states. Now, let me share something with you, gentlemen. Do you know which state they spend most of their time talking about? The state of New Hampshire. The what? Old, the only state that flipped Republican. I, I am telling you, the state they are talking about and the number of voter suppression bills that have already been introduced in 2022 that will probably pass in 2022. And the state they focus on is the state of New Hampshire as an example of what to watch for and what to fear. I, I, I want people to understand. Now, why am I saying this? Because did you hear what Bill Gardner did? Bill Gardner blasted Maggie Hassan over her support for the, uh, what is it, the Freedom to Vote Act. Did you hear about yes, this? Yes, yes. He, in fact, he testified against it. No, I didn't hear about this. Yes. I want to hear more about yes, it. Yes, Bill Gardner's no, gone to the me, dark side. Let me, let me tell you what happened. So New Hampshire Journal, yuck, uh, just put out an article. Here's the title of the article. Gardner blasts Hassan over Fed election takeover. This will hurt turnout, he says. You read the article, and it's a bunch of bull crap all right it is just it's incredible what he's suggesting and then what I, so here's what i did so i tweeted out the following after reading this article and reading his pushback uh, against maggie and against the uh, the freedom to vote act i wrote gardner is no longer a man i recognize he is a hollow shell that now parrots the anti-democratic lies about the freedom to vote act he has sold his soul to the fascists in waiting sad he has rewritten his own obituary as a de former defender of the franchise to a tool of the GOP. <laughs> wow, it, it pretty is, spot on, pretty spot on. Oh, but, but you have to read the article. Because first of all, some of the things he says, so he's pointing to 2020. And he said, look at the numbers. Look at this. Look at this. If you look at 2021 and 2022 and look at the legislation that's been introduced by the Republicans, everything that would have supported a, a, a robust election is being drained out of our electoral system. They want to stop it. They don't want to use voting machines anymore. They want to hand count everything. Why? Because they know that that will be about delay. And you know what delay means? As soon Doubt. as you delay a result, Doubt. nobody trusts the result. Okay? Then you look at what they want to do, the impediments to who, in fact, is a resident of New Hampshire. All the bills that they're introducing in 2022, you read, you talk to Bill Gardner, and I want Bill Gardner to say, do you approve of this, Secretary of State Gardner? Do you approve of this? Because you're looking backwards, and i got to look forward. And if you don't have the freedom to vote act then guess what new hampshire will not have the kind of franchise that you basically claim you support because it will not exist and he knows that which is why he's such a never mind i can't even use the word wow but he attacked maggie he attacked maggie and said that she is going to hurt our elections no the republicans he's standing with they're the ones that are hurting our elections Hurting our elections, they're threatening our entire democracy. You know, Arnie, you, 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 you. The franchise is about. That's where it starts, Bob. Bob, if you can, if you can basically throw away votes, or you can make a decision about who the what the result is, whether the result is accurate or not. That's how you own. That's how you own a country. That's, that's when you own a country. Back. Exactly right, yeah. Arnie. What what about the um, on on the on a parallel track? Not only are they doing this to the actual franchise and the ballot counting and the ballot distribution, but they're redistricting in such a way that um, it, there will be no competitive races. It will be impossible to run a competitive race in either district. So, so they're doing to the state what they did to Manchester. Manchester should 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 have three senators, but they split it up in su and join towns in such a way that we only get two Democratic senators, and they always get one. And so they're doing the same thing to New Hampshire. They're making sure that what we have right now, a full complement of Democratic Congress people and, and senators, can't happen because they're, they're going to throw the District 2 to the Democrats as long as they can keep District 1. Fair assessment? Oh, let, let's understand what this partisan gerrymandering is about. It means that the November election is moot. It has no meaning. The only election that has meaning is the primary, and it will be the Republican primary where all the action takes place. That's what partisan gerrymandering is about. You're absolutely right. That is what this is. And this is a situation where you have politicians who've made a decision using, you know, logarithms and using, you know, whatever they do at their computer tables to basically allow politicians to pick their voters. Yep. Not only are they going to get to pick their voters, they're then going to restrict what people within that district can vote and then they're going to decide how you count the vote oh my god it's a try yeah then, and then the state house is going to decide what that count really means right 
exactly. <laughs> and it's on every level. They are dissecting the way we actually approach democracy, and they are draining anything that resembles democracy out of what will actually happen in November of 2022. And by November of 2024, they will have their anointed president. Yeah, and enshrine minority rule in this country, you know, for the future, for the indefinite foreseeable future. And it's, it's, so, it's, it's absolutely appalling. It has to be opposed. And Marnie, I was so glad to hear you say that the key to this is what's happening in state legislatures. Yes. And yes. that's okay. The, but but aren't we late to the dance on that? I have been reading and hearing and watching discussions for years about how the Democrats focus on Washington and the Republicans are doing the grassroots work of getting state legislators, getting secretaries of state who run elections, secretaries of state. And let's remember who saved us in Georgia. Republicans with integrity who who are going to be gone. They're not going to make it, right? Am I am I wrong? They're out. So well, we yeah, can't that's rely the plan. on them. That's the plan. Yep, but gonna, it's yeah. it's the the action's been in the state houses for years and years and years, but um, the party that I would prefer to vote for wasn't playing. Well, so you're absolutely right. We tend to focus on Washington and we don't focus on Concord. We don't focus on Augusta. Whatever. Not to mention whatever the courts, the okay? Not even to mention the courts. Well, the courts are minor. The state legislature. They're not minor. The key. Well, they're, they're let, not let, as let big me, as the state Let me just say something else. They also do something else. They not only look at state legislatures and they look at local government and they look at city councils and state boards, but they have a long plan. They, they don't care if they lose after the first two years. They have a 10-year strategy and a 20-year strategy. We don't. As soon as we lose one thing, we're like, oh, that didn't work. Well, wait a minute. Go back and refine it. But not only do we not refine it, but we run to Washington all the time. I mean, I remember interviewing Ralph Reed. In 1990, you remember Ralph Reed? You remember Ralph Reed of the Christian Coalition? Oh yes, Ralph yes. Reed said Ralph in Reed. Okay. He said, "Arnie, by two, all right, right." He said, but "Ralph Reed, by 2000, he said the 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 uh, the moral majority, whatever you want to call it, the, the the Christian Coalition will control two thirds of the Republican legislatures and the Republican parties around this country." He said, "By 2000, we will accomplish it." Guess what? They accomplished it by 1998. They were two years ahead of time, but they had a 10 year plan. So not only do they have a long term plan, not only are they methodical, but let me tell you what else they do. They have outside financial resources that help them. Let me give you an example. Americans for Prosperity. Americans for Prosperity aids and abets the Republican Party to accomplish everything. Not only who gets elected, but the legislation that they want to see passed. So the Koch brothers have understood this for a long time, and they have seeded in very strategic states around the country their organizations, and those organizations have basically fulfilled the wet dream of the Republican Party. And, but they, and, but they go all the way the down way. the level. They will provide a small donation to a state rep candidate. They will... They will provide a donation to Victoria Sullivan to run for mayor. Um, you, you, you know, they're paying attention to the fine grain details. Well, and let, but I will give you a perfect example of how sophisticated they are and how micro focused they are. OK, so if you care about the franchise, you also care about something else. It's called public education. Because you need to be informed in order to really exercise the franchise. So public education is the key. What do we know the Republicans and Americans for Prosperity want to do? They Dismantle want to get it. rid of government funded schools. They want to get rid of public education. And here is an example of what AFP did that blew everybody away. We have the most outrageous voucher slash scholarship program in the country. We've talked about it. Is it is the most extreme in the United States. Well, they thought that only a couple of hundred thousand dollars was going to be exercised by uh, by families pulling their kids out of public school and putting them into either homeschool settings, religious settings, or, or private schools. Well, guess what AFP did? AFP went door to door. Americans for Prosperity sold the vouchers, sold the concept of the scholarships, and instead of it only being a couple of hundred thousand dollars we've now seen between nine and ten million dollars being drained out of the public education coffers so not only do they get the law but then they get the marketing team to actually market what they're doing to destroy public education yeah. the democrats have no response to that none you know i think it's worth reminding people if that people don't remember 
there was a fellow that ran the Americans for Prosperity in New Hampshire named Corey Lewandowski. He's still yes, a resident yes. of Wyndham, New Hampshire, where he gets into litigation with his neighbors, apparently. But he was also, at one time, the Trump campaign manager in the uh, 2016 election. Think about that. I, I, I mean, and, and it and comes back to New Hampshire, which is what's just so interesting about the New York Times article, is that it focuses so much on the, on the election bills. And there are 50 states, everyone. But look at the state that they spend most of their time talking about, the state of New Hampshire as the poster child for basically voter disenfranchisement. How scary yeah. is that? And I have, to say, I have to say, Arnie, I'm glad you brought up the, the, the sad case of Bill Gardner. I was a big fan of Bill Gardner's. You know, most of the time that he was, when I was in office and he was Secretary of State, which has been, you know, uh, for a long, long right. time. And uh, he was a frequent guest on this show. And then when he decided to go off and become a Trump's, part of Trump's Electoral Integrity Commission, chaired by the notorious Kansas uh, Secretary of State at the time, Chris Kobach, and he agreed to co-chair that commission to, to you know, to discern and, and justify the claims of massive amounts of election fraud. Uh, it, uh, it, it came a cropper, and I've, I, you know, that was too much for me, and I had to support the guy who ran against, uh, ran against Gardner to be Secretary of State the last time. And uh, it went to a vote that was pretty much a tie, but Gardner prevailed by uh, just the barest of margins. And he did it partly because he said he, this would be his, he let it be known. I don't know if he actually said it, but he let it be known. This would be my last attempt to run, have another two-year term as Secretary of State. The Secretary of State's elected by the New Hampshire legislature, one of the few offices that we elect in New Hampshire, along with the state treasurer. And, and the sergeant uh, at arms. The sergeant <laughs> Well, that's for each house. I'm talking about statewide. <laughs> Good point, though. You know, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I certainly am very, very distressed about where he's taking us now after all the credit he gathered for being the great well, but, defender but, but, of the Nancy primary. But, but there's a level of dishonesty here, everyone. Remember, because of COVID, we did things that we had never done before in our election process. Remember, you couldn't get an absentee ballot unless you were ill or out of the state. All of a sudden, all of us were ill because of COVID-19. Yep. So anyone yep. could get an absentee ballot. That was a good ballot. thing, by the way. I, I don't know why they don't continue that. Yeah, that was we, should a great thing. we should continue that. It, it increased the vote. I agree, but, that, but that's actually in some ways part of what's in the, the Freedom to Vote Act. What Bill Gardner is doing is pointing to 2022 when we actually liberalized our own voting system more than we had ever done in our history. Yeah. And if you look at what the Republicans are introducing in 2020, they want to shrink it all back down and go even farther. So he's being disingenuous. He knows exactly what they're doing. It's better to look at an anomaly of 2020 yep. than to look at what the future is and what the future is is fewer people being able to vote fewer people trusting the election and ultimately they are able to control how the vote is not only cast but how it is actually collected that is what's so scary and gardner knows it which is why not only am i disgusted yep. with him but to some extent he's a what is that what's a nice way of calling someone a liar <laughs> all right because Arnie, I feel Arnie, we're gonna liar. we're gonna take our first break it may be the last break because we're kind of beyond yeah, time we'll split here it in two. Uh, but we are going to take our first break. We'll chat with you about which, which, where you'd like to go next. But I want to remind people that we, we welcome, we really welcome, we relish if you will solutions. call in and call participate. In with the solution. You want to call in and say why you think Trump should be president and like the president in 2024? You want to call in and tell us why we're being foolish to think that democracy is at, at risk in America? Please do it. We'd love to hear from you. You want to support us? That would be fine, too. But we'd love to hear from you. So uh, as you get ready for the great uh, Christmas weekend coming up, uh, please participate. We'd welcome you. We'll be right back.
Tiger Support for this uh, Wednesday in December. You know, Christmas uh, weekend coming right up. Uh, Christmas Eve and Friday, Christmas Saturday. And we're happy to welcome yeah. a caller. We love we our callers. Love the callers. Welcome, Hello. caller. You're on the Progress Report. This is Robert calling. Hey, Robert. Go right ahead. Okay. From what I've seen and from what I've heard, I do believe this country is going through a revolution, maybe even a civil war, or perhaps even there'll be a coup in this government. Yeah. We have to stop this before it happens. We've got to mobilize. We've got to do what is right for democracy. Because democracy right now is being attacked and destroyed. We have to do something, and I hope that we do. Robert, what do you think we should do? I mean, what what would be your way to prevent this from becoming a reality? Because we have to tell the people of this country what's going on. They have to understand what's going on. And it's and and it's it's the people of this country that's going to save it. If anybody it's does, gonna be a, it's going to be a hard thing to do, but we have to do it. Yeah, we have to tell the American people what is going on here. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. I absolutely could not agree more. Well, thanks for the call, Robert. Yeah, we appreciate it, and that's what we're trying to do here today. That's, that's what, what we're the, trying to that, do. That's what the Atlantic is doing in their articles. That's what Arnie does on her mission uh, uh, in in her media empire. Um, it, you know, it's it's important, um, but the problem is that we are already so fractured. The the horse has left the barn. The train has left the station. We are so fractured. I cannot get my brother to watch anything but Fox News. And if those people are going to do what they did, on the one hand, text the president and say, you got to stop this, or text his, uh, his, his chief of staff, and then on the other hand, go on TV 10 seconds later and say, well, stop what? There's nothing going on. Uh, you know, how, how can you deal with that lack of integrity. What do you do? I, Arnie, we've talked, we've complained, we've, we've pointed out the problems show after show. What does the viewer do? How can the viewer become part of the solution? So, so we know that there's a real push now on the voting bills in, in Congress, okay? And, and we have to get rid of the filibuster in order to do it. We know that's why they attacked Maggie Hassan, because she came on the floor of the Senate to say that she was in support of it. And people were wondering whether she was, because it would require her walking away from the filibuster. So let me yes. tell you why. That was an important speech, by the way. Um, that, you know, a lot of people, when we talk about the filibuster, I don't want to get uh, far afield, but when we talk about the filibuster alone, they look at cinema and mansion, but there's a lot of Democrats hiding behind those skirts. And, uh, yes. and, and I'm glad to see that Maggie came out from behind there. All right, but, but let me explain something about, I want to go directly to what the caller said, because he mentioned the word civil war. He's afraid of what's going on. What's happening now is, is that if we don't have a level playing field about how we vote, if we don't have a level playing field about how we, um, we, we do the, the, the gerrymandering, so there isn't partisan gerrymandering, there's redistricting, okay? If we can ensure that 50 states all know that anyone, whether you're in one state or another, that you still have the same right to vote with the same sort of process, and the redistricting is done in a way that's fair and not with a thumb on a partisan scale, that's how you save us. But if we don't, then we are going to be in a civil war. Because you know what the difference is? It's kind of like a group of states had slaves and a group of states didn't have slaves. Well, in the states where you're not allowed to vote, that's a slave state. That's what that means. You know, you, it's not, you don't have to just be in slavery uh, by being bought and sold. If you are not allowed to exercise the franchise or they create all these impediments for you to be part of a democratic process, you're not a citizen. But You're Arnie, we have seen this. You. We have seen this. There are people alive who lived through Jim Crow. Where's the amnesia? Why are we having such a hard time convincing people that that's where we're going? Because the Republican Party is no longer a party. They are now fascists in waiting. This is about an authoritarian government. This is about, they, they don't believe in democracy anymore. Don't you get it? That's, That's what's it. so frightening. They believe in power, but they don't believe in democracy. They, they, they want economic success, but not for all of us, for the 1%. Do they care about climate change? They'll be dead. 
I mean, that's really how they look at it. It's almost like they're into this manana thing. They're into the idea that they're, you know, the monopolies are going to protect them, and they're going to have their wealth, and they're going to have their power, and and ultimately, who's going to suffer? But all of us. And you know what's so ironic is that in the end, they will suffer too. Yeah. Because it turns out that the stability of this economy is good for Republicans. It turns out fighting COVID is good for Republicans. It turns out that a fair franchise is good for Republicans because it gives them a shot. When they control everything, only the rock gets protected and none of the good. You know, I, I can't, I can't oh, resist. God. Everybody says you should stay away from talking about the rise of the Nazis in Germany, but I think it's got lessons for us. Dear I Lord, really, the I, patterns where I mean, we're literally really really living do. day to day through the progression uh, I, I, I think you of Italy, through the progression. I think you consider the, the uh, January 6th insurrection at the Capitol kind of like the beer hall putsch in Munich in 1923 or whatever it was when Hitler first attempted to seize power in Germany. Far more substantial, far more substantial to well, the point of not even being equatable because that was in support of a sitting president. Yeah, Adolf Adolf sure. Hitler in at, in the beer putsch was a former corporal but, uh, with a bunch of disgruntled but what guys. Hitler, what Hitler learned from that, and what I think Trump has You're, learned, the rehearsal part of it. Yes, I, I can see that. It, I can see we that. are going to seize power legally which means we have to change the law in our favor. That's what's going to happen. Yes, the rehearsal part, I can I mean, see. you know, I mean. But I think in our, in our Hitler took power situation. legally in Germany. Understood, and, but what I'm saying is, in our situation, we are so much further down the road because it is not an outsider performing this. This came from the White House. This was our own that's president doing true. this to us. Yeah. That's true. Okay. Yeah. Now, now we managed yeah. to survive, and right. he's out, but he's not that far out. He's just on the other side of the door. Yeah. You would think that a guy who had lost the presidency by an <laughs> overwhelming number of votes in the popular vote and by a substantial amount in the Electoral College and no longer has the White House, has been kicked off of social media, Facebook and Twitter. He shouldn't have any friends. He shouldn't have any <laughs> friends. But his dominance over the Republican Party is absolutely as great as ever. Have you ever heard the phrase, a leader without followers is just a guy taking a walk? I yeah. don't know. I've, I may have heard that one or two places. Yeah. Um, but this guy's but, got followers, but, so that gives him the clout that, but, uh, that we're no, seeing. No, no, no. But you're, you're focused on the wrong person. You're focusing on Donald Trump. There are now a dozen Donald Trump. Understood. No, I agree with you. Governor Abbott. He's, he's Donald Trump in waiting. What do you think is DeSantis? He's Donald Trump in waiting. What do you think about the governor of Iowa? She's Donald Trump in waiting. There are now, it's, it's a hydra. And they're more capable politicians than Donald Trump, I think. Trump. Yeah. They, they have more well, experience in politics and government. Yeah. Mary Trump said that they have now gone beyond Donald. Yeah. Donald is yesterday's story. They are now more sophisticated. They are more lethal. They won't make the mistakes of the buffoon Donald Trump. They are taking what Donald Trump handed them, and they are now going to go to the extreme, and they know exactly how yeah. to do it. And, and look what he, he did during his time in office to prepare the way for this. First of all, he denigrated the press, the fourth estate. Enemies of the people. You can't believe these people. He mocked tackles a, a, you know, somebody posing as a CNN reporter. And he, he goes down, and these are very bad people, he says, rallies, and point to the, point to the press. You know, so, so, so first of all, he gets a large number of the Americans, mostly Republicans. Fascist tactics. Not, not, not to press. believe anything they hear if it doesn't echo their own preferred pre-existing views. And uh, then he then he then he derives language of all meaning, a la Brave New World. You know, uh, the the, the attack Bob, on the Capitol was just, a love we're fest. We're sitting here whining. We're whining. Oh, I, my know, God, I know. I know. So successful, but what are we going to do about it? Yeah, What's what the gonna, solution? Yeah. I haven't heard any. I mean, I I I I, I, I mean, it's on me to come up with yeah. something too. But Arnie, go. But the French franchise is the solution if we can protect it. If we can't protect it, they will have the guns, they will have the ammunition, they will control the votes, they will control how they're counted, and they will control Congress, yep. and they will control the White House. So it turns out they, they've got so much in their quiver. And what we have is the vote. Yep. The problem is only if we can protect it. And I'm going to I'm going to share something else. So you saw it. Let's go to COVID because I think it's really important that we talk about COVID, especially in relationship to New Hampshire. New Hampshire for the last until I think two days ago had the highest COVID per capita count in the country for over two weeks. Okay, New Hampshire. 
about were there 50 states we were number one here's what you have to ask yourself how is it possible that the seventh richest state in the nation with only four percent uninsured with one of the most highly sort of credentialed high academic scores could end up being the state with the highest COVID per capita counts in the country and let me tell you something so i wrote the following uh we had 25 deaths on tuesday highest ever here was my question highest ever how many of the 25 deaths were not vaccinated, number one? How many are Republicans? Please understand, there is such a huge differential based on party affiliation. Whether you are vaccinated or not is a relationship to party. So that's why I asked the question, and I want unvaccinated Republicans to hear, if most of those dead people are Republicans, they have to start asking themselves, what did we believe and why? And then I have something from Kaiser Health News. Listen to this. It turns out political partisanship serves as a better predictor for COVID-19 vaccination status than any other demographic factor. You could look at age, you could look at race, education, insurance status. None of those have any meaning. You look at partisan politics and that will tell you whether you're more likely vaccinated. Or Are you surprised by that data? Would you, would you not have predicted that result before the no. study? Of course not. But what I'm telling you is, not only are they lethal to democracy, they are lethal to their own base. <laughs> they have, they have care. I mean, Donald Trump There's talks a about solution, got isn't vaccinated it? and got getting a voucher, and then when he gets booed, he goes, "Oh, oh, oh, it's not a problem. It's your choice. It's your choice." Why doesn't he look at them saying, "Don't you want to live?" But he doesn't have the balls to do it. Oh my God, it's yeah. unbelievable. I mean, everyone is expendable for their power. Everyone including their base they don't care about any of them yeah. that's what's so sad you know i care more about their base than they care about their base people keep saying you know it's the darwin you know survival of the fittest i'm going no 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 it's manipulation and that's why they're going to die it's awful it's awful i'm sorry you know i i do think one just, part of the solution here mike and i i know what you're saying is we need to elevate this issue to the top list of the priorities. We got terrible priorities that need addressing. We got climate change. We got the, we got the, the pandemic. We got a crumbling infrastructure. We got the fact that we're, you know, uh, you know, I just heard tonight that the life expectancy in the United States has dropped two years since the pandemic Not arrived, two. which is hardly surprising, but it is distressing. The lowest population increase in history. Everything population. is bad. All Everything the indicators is bad. are bad. Okay, but we, the we number see that. one thing that and we it's Joe got, Biden's fault, right? Yeah, well, no, it's not Let's Joe Let's go Biden's. Brandon, right? Uh, that'll, yeah. that'll fix it, right? Let's go Brandon. That'll, that'll. But I think we have to do this, and this is why I'm glad that Arnie's with us on this show tonight. We have to say the threat to democracy has to go to the top. It has to go to the top. We, we have the feeling that because we've had a democracy for 250 years and we survived a civil war and secession and the Great Depression and all of that, that it can't happen here. Well, there was a novel written by Sinclair Lewis in the 1930s that it can happen here. And at that, that, that time, it seemed really far-fetched. It's not far-fetched now. This has got to be the organizing principle for us all as the number one priority over all these other extremely important but things. But it isn't. People can't get the flat screen they want for the day after tomorrow. You know, it, yeah. it's not the number one priority. So now what? Yeah. So, no, no. So, so here's the problem. You, what, voting needs to matter. Not just because you can exercise the franchise, but because you can point to results. So if your vote doesn't get results that touch your life, then you don't value the vote. All right, that, that's what, and, and Biden gets that. So if I elect Joe Biden and I don't get a child credit, if I elect Joe Biden and I don't get my infrastructure fixed, if I, don't, if I elect Joe Biden and I don't get parental leave, if I elect Joe Biden and I don't get an increase in the minimum wage, if I elect Joe Biden and I don't get an expansion of Medicare, then what was the point of my vote? 
See, that's the problem. You can't tell people that democracy is important unless you can show them that democracy has results and positive results that affect their yeah. lives. You heard what Joe Manchin supposedly yeah. said about the Build Back Better bill. Yeah. The reason he doesn't like the child care credit going to everyone is that he thinks that people will use the money from the child credit to buy drugs. What did he say about parental leave? He doesn't want people to get parental leave because all they'll do is go out hunting. They'll go hunting. The fact of the matter is, though, there are facts. There, there is, there is actual evidence of what people have done with their stimulus, their, their, their child care, their child credit checks, and it has gone to Staples, to food, to child care, so the parent can go back to work. It has. They know where the money has gone. He's making something up that's coming out of the middle of his belly, has no basis in fact. It, it comes from his biases and his racial yes. misinformation. Uh, it's Ronald Reagan. Right, it's the young, Reagan. the young, I, that, I, that's you, exactly you irritated me bringing up that comment me, from Joe Manchin. Well, but let, but let me just say one other thing. I wanted to sort of turn to Joe Manchin and say, so on parental leave, they're gonna go out hunting. So in West Virginia, did they do sports hunting or do they fill their freezer for the winter? Why do they hunt? They hunt because they don't have money for food. Right. And so if they, they kill an elk or they kill a deer or they kill a bear, they're feeding their families. He knows it, yeah. but he drives a Maserati. There are some he people in New Hampshire in that same situation. Yacht. He knows it, but, he makes, but he makes, he's a coal baron. He is, he's so out of touch with his own people. That's what that comment is about. Yeah. He's an arrogant fool because he's out of touch. Yeah. And then let me remind everyone. So they all want to micromanage the little credit that poor people are getting. They want to micromanage parental leave. But when they did the huge tax cuts on corporations, they not only did not micromanage those huge tax cuts, but we were told that they were going to invest in their workers. They were going to invest in capital development what did they do with that huge tax cut they did stock buybacks and they made their management and their stockholders yeah. richer and we got screwed and the deficit exploded i think something i think Manchin something that all of our viewers can that. can recognize on that regard is uh, all of the covid money that the airlines took in order to keep them alive and then um, they couldn't deliver any passengers they canceled all yeah. their flights they 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 took the money that was supposed to keep those flights flying, and then they didn't fly the flights. Where's the explanation for that? Well, you know, so I was listening to um, Sununu. I guess Sununu was upset about some contract that was going to be going to Convenient MD. It was like a sole source contract, and they were going to get all this money for Convenient MD, and he was so upset about it. It's kind of like he's playing it both ways. He's a mugwump. He wants to look like he's upset, but he's looking at the Republicans going, yeah, vote for it. Yeah, vote for it. Well, let me just share something about public education. We just gave a group, I think they're called Prenda. Have you ever heard of Prenda? Prenda is a company from Arizona. We just gave Prenda $5.8 million to work with people who are being, creating these things called education pods. So Prenda, had, they had an original contract, they just got a new contract. No competitive bidding, they got this enormous amount of money. In the last, like, 10 months, do you know how much Prenda has been able to include in their pods? 100 people. They just got millions of dollars in a no competitive bid from the state of New Hampshire to create these pods that nobody even knows what they are, and they just got their contract renewed based on what? Based on what? Yeah. I mean, again. Well, that's your we friend Frank, Frank Edelblut, right? Yes, yes. Again, it's the, the most dangerous money. man. He, he, I, I can remember a time when the late uh, rest his soul Richard Flynn was the most powerful man in the state. But it sounds like Frank, Frank Edelblut might be uh, the the Dick Flynn of the 2020s. So we are we are throwing money at an organization that does nothing, that really doesn't work with any families, that wants to dismantle public education. We renew their contract not based on success, but based on what? On the fact that Edel Blue says, oh, well, they're just starting out. But we do not we, renew the contracts for Planned Parenthood who have gone yes, through the new statutory right. process of, right. of pr proving their money is segregated. Even though they pass yes. the test, they don't get their yes. funding. So the test had no meaning. I understand that. It it's a Republican test. test. Of course it has no meaning. Yes. Well, it's political. And the Republican <laughs> test, exactly. So, I mean, I just want people to know there's no accountability. There's no transparency. There's no competitive bidding. It doesn't matter what you say. It matters who gets the cash. Yeah.
That's what this is all about. Yeah. So they dazzle you with their concern, and then when you actually look at what their concern is, there is no concern. Here's your cash. Yeah. No competitive bidding. It's disgusting. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I don't know what to do. We are we are we are in a really tough situation here. And you know, I said, and I and I stand by it, that I think the number one thing was we have to have the priority of saving our democracy by pushing back against these Republican efforts to suppress the vote, to oust the election officials who are neutral and disinterested, and replace them with partisan vote counters. All of these things. Who's doing that, Bob? Who is doing that? What group do I get on the phone right after this show, call up and say, sign me up, I want to help you do this project well, that Bob I, told I, me? Well, I did see an encouraging thing the other day on one of the cable shows. I think maybe it was Rachel's show. And she had, no, no maybe not, but and she had on two very prominent lawyers, a guy named Bauer, who represented the Obama campaign. Okay. Yes, yes. And yes. a guy named Ben Ginsburg, very conservative yes. Republican lawyer. I used to hate to watch him. But they've come together to say, we will form a, we, we are recruiting lawyers across the country who will defend election officials who are being attacked by the Trump Republicans for doing their jobs. And uh, yes. so that's very that's encouraging. A start. That's a start. That's, that's the start. That's the kind of thing we need. I, I applaud those distinguished gentlemen who are both well-recognized experts on electoral law. And I think we need more of that. I'm kind of wondering about the organization that is designed and its sole function is to argue points against this neo-fascist yeah, party. Brexit. I'm talking about Brennan, the Democratic the Party. Where the heck are they? No, well, it, it's the, the Brennan Center is doing it. Those lawyers are doing it. I, I don't understand why the Democratic Party isn't focused on this like a laser. Well, I mean, we were, I mean, Let, let me not? push back a little bit on that, Arnie. You know, I've said, I, and we all agree, of the three of us, I think, that the, this should be the number one priority, is saving our democracy against the Trump Republican attacks, which is the Republican attacks. Republican attacks. But, you know, how do we save it? First of all, we have to somehow see if we can hold on to the Congress in the 2022 elections. And the key to holding on to the Congress, <laughs> I think, is we got to somehow pass this Bill Back Better bill. If we can't do that and deliver things for the American people that they want... Strike two. <laughs> uh, then, then, you know, the whole January 6th committee is going to be shut down. All these people that are suing the committee, like Michael Flynn and Mark Meadows... And uh, Flynn, Flynn lost his injunction today. They're getting, they're getting knocked down. He lost his injunction, but he's just going to appeal. I mean, you know, they're trying to run out the clock in the hopes that the Republicans will take over the Congress, and that will shut down any inquiry. Into, and it and, will, because and, they know how to play. Yeah. They know when they got the power what to do. Yeah. We have the power, and we're throwing it up in the air. We're, we're, we're arguing over well, it. Well, do we have the power? I shouldn't turns say out, we. I'm, turns out 50 votes in the Senate is not much power. I mean, not, not with the filibuster. Not so, when you don't have 50 um, votes. You don't have 50 <laughs> votes. Well, let me, let me let me, let me ask you both a question. Um, I cover Texas politics. And remember when they had the, the bathroom bill with transgender mm -hmm. people using bath? The reason why that bill never succeeded, even though the, it's a hugely Republican majority, so both the House and the Senate, the governor's a Republican, lieutenant governor. I mean, you know why it didn't pass? Because the business community wouldn't let it pass. Yeah. Because the business community basically said to the Republican majority and to the governor, oh, we don't want this. This is not good for our business. We don't want this. So I have to start asking another question. Does the business community want a civil war? Does the business community want the Republicans truly in power? Is that what they really want? I don't think so. Yeah. Because what you're going to I don't have think it's a priority have, for them that it is for us, though. That's the problem. Oh, oh, oh no. I, 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 th I think you're wrong. The, the level of instability that we are looking at going forward if the Republicans take over is not only detrimental to the, the franchise and to democracy, it is detrimental to business. Let me tell well, you now, it is bad for business. Do they know that, though, Arnie? Do they know that? Because they were all going down to Mar-a-Lago. Um, what was the quote? I just I just made you guys millions with, when, the, when the tax cuts pass uh, and and they're soaking it up like gravy on bread and let's not forget that in the 1930s in germany big business thought they could control hitler they did they did not come out and, and oppose hitler whether it was krupp or farben or you know siemens or whatever 
So, you, you know, I, I, I won't rest too much hope on the big business turning <laughs> things around for us. I have no faith in big business not, to do I'm anything not, right. I'm not, asking, I'm not asking for big business to do it. But at the same time, I think there has to be a level of awareness. I mean, what's, what created this incredible financial infrastructure that we have in America with Wall Street? It was things like the Securities and Exchange Commission. It was what government did to create economic stability and fairness is what made Wall Street what Wall Street is. Trust me, if it was just them, they would have eaten themselves alive. That's what happened. Yeah. They have to have a memory because if they don't have a memory, they're not going to have a future. I'm just telling you right now, everyone, they're not going to have an economic Well, future. I'm going to call that strike three. But, you know, I mean, Bob is, is, is hoping things will turn around. You're hoping that, um, you know, there'll be some sort of an institutional memory. There's no memory in this country. This country can't remember... Uh, you know, 20 years ago, uh, it, 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 it just yeah. doesn't exist. Yeah. I wish it were so. I studied history. I, it's a passion of mine. Me too. And, and, I, and I see things that it, to me are obvious and other people wonder what's going on. I, 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 you know, you're asking for something that's not there. You know, it's, it's Christmas time. I, I, you know, I realize it's a good, we all have our hopes up, um, you know, but if it's not there, it's not there. I'm just going to say something, um, and don't be offended by this, but you will be. You're just a white guy. And let me tell you why I say you're just a white. No, no, just listen to me. Well, you're a white gal. I plead guilty. No, I get, I I hear what you're saying. If you are an African-American, you've had your teeth kicked. You've, you've, you've been burned and you've been hung and you had slavery and you, I mean, th- you have to have the civil rights movement. Think about all the things, Emmett Till, think about all these things. And they still keep fighting and they still keep fighting. We're raising the white flag and saying we can't imagine what to do. Well, you know what you need to do? You need to figure out what your African-American brothers and sisters have figured out. And that is they don't trust anything, but they keep fighting because they actually do. The people that most believe in America are not us. It's them. They actually an believe in point. the promise, and we an don't. Interesting point indeed. How pathetic are we? Well, I want to. I mean, I want to learn from them. I want to be strong like them. I want to fight like them. They actually believe in America, and you've just given up. No, so, I, 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 I hear everything you're saying, but I'm not saying that I'm giving up. I'm not giving up. But what, what I'm, I'm searching. I'm searching for the solution, and what I'm hearing is aspiration. And there isn't one solution. It's not going to happen. There isn't a magic bullet. You're going to have to do it all. You're going to have to figure out how to protect the franchise. You're going to have to figure out how to talk to the business community. You're going to have to figure out how to make sure that the Build Back Better bill passes. It's complicated. It ain't easy. But you know what? If we can figure it out, we can actually succeed. But if you think that there's one answer, yeah. then, sweetheart, you're losing. Well, Arnie, you know what? For that answer, I'm glad I asked the question. That was a great answer, and I'm really glad I heard it. Thank you very much for yeah. that. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm glad. That was a great answer. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad I heard it. Yeah, you know, yeah, I yeah, think yeah. she's being a little harsh on me, but uh, okay, maybe <laughs> I deserve I it. <laughs> we're, we're not. We're not I about to enter so hell so with, uh, with Dante. <laughs> You know, you know what? You know why white men are so angry? White men are angry because they used to own the bench. They didn't have any competition. Women weren't competing with them. African Americans and Hispanics weren't competing with them, and so they lost twice. Not only did they lose their place on the bench, but all the manufacturing jobs left. So they used to earn a good living. They controlled the bench, and they could take care of their families. Now they're screwed. Not only do they not have a good job, not only do they have competition for those jobs, but guess what? Their salaries are shrinking year after year after year, which is why what you saw what happened with Kellogg, what you saw what happened with John Deere, what you're seeing what's happening with the baristas at whatever that. But those, that those are good things. Those things that you're citing, those three, those are good things. That's progress. That's the union movement being re-energized. But that's democracy. You know what? The union movement is about democracy. I, I agree completely. That's what it's about. It's with the democratization of the workplace, and more and more people are supporting it. I mean, I listened to a guy from Kellogg's. He had never been on strike. He had voted Republican all his life. And Bernie Sanders was there, and he said, that's the only politician I can trust. You know, because he understood the connection between what Bernie was saying and his life, and that's why he was willing to go on strike. It's amazing, but that's democracy in action, everyone. And he was willing to go on strike for weeks to make it happen. Yeah. So you know, we look to Bernie. Bernie has the- somehow Bernie has some uh, some finger on the pulse. Not, he does. not, not for a lot does. of people. He doesn't. 
A lot of people don't think he's got his finger but, on the pulse. But, but, well, but those people are wrong, obviously, Bob. I mean. But they count. They can count. They can vote. Bob, Bob, it's not just a Bernie. There are a lot of pulses. What we have to do is figure out how to connect to them. You know, one politician's not going to do it just the way Donald Trump, unfortunately, yeah. thinks he can do it. We don't want one. We want a team. We want a team. Well, we now see we Joe Biden, who is acceptable to old fuddy-duddies like Bob, and uh, it was, yep. you know, it was successful to wrest the White House away from this tyrant. Um, yes. But yes, was it? W will he be able to, to? Will he be able to pass his agenda? If, um, any, if anybody, I hope so. I think he's the best person that we have in the country to do it, which doesn't mean he's going to do it. But with his knowledge of the Congress from his many years in the Senate. He has the relationships and the skills and the knowledge about the procedure. If anybody can do it, he can. Can I ask a question of both of you? Uh, oh, I can't because we only have two minutes in the show and it would take much too long. It's too bad because I... Uh, well, go ahead. Well, well here, we quick question. Back. Why did we take this Be, uh, Build Back Better bill and make it so enormous? Why not pass a child uh, credit bill? Why not... Pat. Because you know why? Because, because of reconciliation. Okay. Because if you if you don't make it into reconciliation, you need sixty votes. If you put it in reconciliation, you only. Need I understand. 50 votes I, you want I understand. Then but it you, seems my, to me it's my, much my, easier to sell the smaller bill. Well, well, my answer to that, right. Mike, would but be it's that it's not about Biden. the sell. It's about the number of votes. It's about the number of votes you need. Yep. Sixty versus fifty. Are, they're, they're two. That's the answer. I I asked the question because I didn't know, and, and I have an answer. Okay, and I, I think I don't know. The, the, my answer is the same. You go you go big. Because you know you're going to have to compromise and give things up on the way, so you start out big. It, what, and, and and reconciliation only takes 51 votes. There you go. I'm going with Arnie's answer. answer. Sorry, Bob. No offense, yeah, that, man. I, right. I think Arnie's <laughs> answer makes a heck of a lot more sense. Yeah. Than that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I, I, I've done the math. I've done the math. So what we're almost out of time. We're this almost out of time, Arnie. This, is, this, is, this, is, this has been a, a great conversation, as it is every time you join us, Arnie. We're so glad you are. You are so glad you're here and uh, and and speaking. And uh, I I know you got other venues you can speak out on, and you will continue to do that. And that's uh, well, really mean, really important. BAI um, uh, on Monday morning. I'm doing New York City radio on Monday morning at like 7:30, I think. Yeah. So I mean, I'm, I'm lucky because I get to go places. Yeah. But that's not what I'm lucky about. I learn from so many fabulous people. Yeah. They teach me the math. Yeah. They teach me the democracy. They teach me the issues. Yeah. And ultimately, we should all be learning the same thing because then we would all be out. Yeah. Well, I, I sure walk away from these Arnie Arneson shows a, a little little bit smarter than I walk in. So thanks for that. I appreciate it. And I once again urge anybody who can get to a newsstand or can get a go to a library and get this most recent issue of the Atlantic the whole thing is just jam packed full of great insight analysis and uh, scare the pants off and you. it'll scare the pants off you which is <laughs> I read which, only one article which, and I'm terrified which is necessary because <laughs> the, the the situation is truly alarming we have a lot of more stuff I'd like to have gotten to but we're out of time I can't thank Arnie enough for joining us Merry Merry Christmas Arnie in your beautiful home and um, Merry Christmas! And I don't know whether we're going to be doing a show between the holidays or not. I don't remember. I can tell you, I will not be. I'm. <laughs> I'm. I'm, I'm uh, that probably means we won't be doing I a show. I have another engagement the on the 29th, so I will not be here. Ah, oh, good. They're closed anyway, so I okay. Missed this is our last show for the year, folks. Hope you liked it. Hope you enjoy it when we have Arnie on. We have good indications that people do like that, and we certainly do. So. Uh, Take care. Have a lovely holiday season. Merry Christmas. See you in 2022. 